So, Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, 22, or actually it's 22 and 23. Uh, You can open up your Bibles. Uh, If you have your Bible app, you can get that out and you can utilize that uh, on the events page because that's what we utilize that a lot. And then um, one of the things that I didn't mention this morning is that we have a digital connect card and you can access that on our website, lhwc.net. And then you can uh, fill that out, especially if you're visiting uh, with us. This is your first time with us, Um, whether here in person or online, we would love it if you would do that for us. So fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says, and against such things, there is no law. One of the things that I realize is that it's, uh, we do a disservice uh, to ourselves um, and our spiritual lives. We mistakenly think that our spiritual life, our spiritual growth, our status in our spiritual lives is all up to us. Or we don't even think that maturity is possible. And so we struggle, we languish, we are dealt with uh, guilt and riddled with uh, just the, this overwhelming sense of, I got to make this happen. And through this series, as we look at the spiritual um, fruit over the course of the, how many ever weeks it's going to be, um, our, my hope is, is that you will realize that our spiritual lives is not about trying harder. It's not about working harder. It's not about uh, just pushing through and, and uh, making sure that we do everything possible to mature. But my hope is that you will see that it's something different, that our spiritual growth, our maturity, experiencing the fruit of the Spirit is about staying connected to Christ. If our focus is about working harder or trying harder, we'd be missing the point. And the point is, is that it's not our fruit. Say that. It's not our fruit. We are not responsible for producing our own fruit. But Galatians is explicit that it is the fruit of the spirit. It's not the fruit of chopper. It's not the fruit of anybody else. It's the fruit of the spirit, the Holy spirit, the, the triune God, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are not something that we can do on our own. And I'm certain that deep down, we already know that, don't we? We probably do, but we don't want to admit it. Because we want to think that we can handle and control these things. Anybody a control freak in here? Oh, yeah. I like to make things happen on my own. And you do, too. We like to control the outcome. We like to make sure that we dot all the eyes and cross all the T's and we make it happen. But that's not what the fruit of the spirit is all about. So um, I, I've uh, sat in a number of uh, sermons over the course of my life about the fruit of the spirit. And I just so happened to uh, listen to one this week. And I thought that, oh my goodness, this is so good. I've got to uh, work this out for us. So I've, uh, I heard some questions that I thought, well, if I can adapt that, let's adapt it and let's make it work for us. So I've got a number of questions that I want to ask you that all relate to the fruit of the spirit. You ready? You can uh, do a couple of things if you want to. You can kind of uh, make a mental checklist if you want to. Actually, I think I put them in the Bible app. So they're there for you if you want to check those out some point in time. Um, so here they are. The first question is about love. 
And this is, it helped me, to, the, the, please know that this isn't romantic love. This isn't like mom and dad and romantic boyfriend, girlfriend, the, the stuff. This is the love that we have for each other, love that we have for God. All right, you, you with me? Same page? Excellent, good. So love, question is, is what is the measure of your love towards God and towards others? Let me say it one more time. What is the measure of your love towards God and towards others? How are you doing in that type of love? I heard someone this week, I heard it, I saw it on Facebook this week, the pastor friend of mine said, um, it's not a matter of whether you love or love God or not. I know that you do, but are you in love with him? Mm, That makes a difference, doesn't it? Slight little word change. Are you in love with God? What's the measure of that for God and for others? Joy. Ready for this one? How easily irritated are you? Bummer. That's a tough one. Because the more that we're irritated, the less joy we have, right? Oh, bummer. Yeah, for real. Uh, Okay, peace. Let's move on to peace before we get really bummed out about joy. Um, Do you find yourself attempting to rest in God, but unable to because of anxiousness or a troubled heart? Unable to because of anxiousness or a troubled heart. Patience. I don't know if I like this one. How do you respond when you're frustrated? How do you respond when you're frustrated? When your neighbor in your apartment building is blaring their music loudly, or your sibling is doing that in their room next door, or your office mate is talking very loudly on the phone and you can't hear what's going on around you. Or things don't work. How frustrated do you get? How do you respond in the midst of it? Kindness. How willing are you to help those in need? How willing are you to help those in need? Hmm. Goodness. Let's talk about the goodness for, for just a moment. Goodness, it uh, has a connotation that is connected more towards um, generosity, but we use the word goodness. And the, the, the question that I have for you is how open are you to give more than just the least amounts? Not just talking about tithing and giving to God, but um, maybe how, how generous are you when you do go out to eat and you get an opportunity to leave, it, leave a tip? Is it all about meeting that certain number? Or is it about being generous? I used to work in the food service business as a, as a waiter years ago. Oh, man, that's hard work. It's no fun. I mean, it is fun, but okay, I just almost went off on a tangent. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Would others say about you that you are dependable? Or would they say, yeah, I can't count on that person for anything. Gentleness. This is a really good question. Can you speak truth and grace at the same time without making others angry? Are you so blunt that people don't want to talk to you? Ooh, I can be that way sometimes. Speak truth and grace. Truth and grace. Gentleness. Last one. Now that you guys are like so totally like, oh, this is tough. I don't like it. Last one, then we'll move on. Self-control. There's a reason why self-control is the last fruit of the Spirit. I hope you know that because it's the, probably the hardest one for everybody. But here's the question. Ready? How prone are you to acting out on impulse? 
I know that you didn't have time to write those questions all down. They're available for you. Use the Bible app. You can find them there. Find Living Hope Wesleyan Church in the events area. But allow these, these questions to maybe um, provide a little bit of accountability this week. Maybe. Now, there are a lot of moving pieces in the context of the passage that Paul's written uh, not only has he given a, a list of the fruit of the Spirit, but in the preceding passage, we also see the opposite um, list, where Paul is talking about the, the acts of the sinful nature. Now, I'm not going to go through that, but what he is doing is, is that he is giving the Galatians the full picture, the whole picture of what is the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the acts of the sinful nature. Paul's not pulling any, any punches here. He's being straight up serious and blunt, and he's explicitly laying out both sides of the argument. And um, he's talking about the life in the flesh and life in the spirit. But what I really want to hone in on for just a moment is I want to get to the where it all begins and why it's important that the fruit of the Spirit is something that we should care about. And so I want to take you back a little bit further to uh, chapter 4, verses 21 in Galatians. And Paul is going to be using a really good... Um, illustration by using uh, the life of Abraham and Sarah. And he says this, tell me, you want to be under the law? Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in, or in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. So, so here's what we're dealing with here in this passage. Paul is reminding the Galatians uh, of Abraham's story, his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. What do we remember about Abraham? Um, well, first of all, he was promised by God uh, that he would be the father of a great nation. And he would have a family and it would outnumber the sands on the seashore and it would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Can you imagine that? This is a guy that's in his uh, late 80s, early 90s, and he does not have a child in his life. And God says, oh, yeah, your family is going to be so huge that you're, you're not going to be able to count them. And if I'm Abraham, this is what I'd be doing. What? What? Seriously, me, I, I don't have a family to speak of. What are you talking about? And, but this is the promise. Now, nothing's happening. Sarah was not getting pregnant. Um, Sarah and Abraham didn't know exactly what to do. And so uh, in the picture walks Hagar. Hagar is the maidservant to Sarah. And Sarah thinks, well, we kind of live in a culture where uh, if the, the, the woman of the house isn't having children. Uh, the maidservant is the one that is given, and they can uh, have children through the maidservant. And so here you go. Here's Hagar. Let's see if this is the way that we're going to have a child, and this is the way that we're going to have a family that God was promising. And so a child is born. His name is Ishmael, and he's born in the most natural way, the most, most normal way. And when I talk about that, what I'm meaning is that it's in the most necessary, no intervention from God type of way. Human nature. I don't need to explain anymore, right? But you remember Abraham's story, don't you? That Abraham is promised a son. It was promised when three mysterious visitors are visiting Abraham and they said, hey, um, in just a little while, months from now, you are going to have a son and Sarah hears it and she laughs out loud. Can you imagine? Yeah. Sarah was barren. No child. 
She's in her 80s, maybe a little bit younger. She's old. Not that that's old, but... <laughs> okay, quick drink and we'll... Whew. She wasn't capable. She wasn't having children. We'll just stop right there. But that didn't matter. The promise was still the promise. God, you see, was up to something. He promised Abraham that child would be born. And his name was Isaac, which means laughter. It was a miracle. It wasn't supposed to happen. It was the special intervention of God that brought about this child being born. So here's the difference between the two sons, okay? Ishmael, Hagar's mother, the, the, I mean, the, the, the son of Hagar, he, he represents the, um, the son of slavery in the sense that he's birthed according to the flesh. Uh, he represents the old covenant. He, he represents a, uh, a law of works, okay? Isaac, the son of promise, the son that was promised to Abraham and Sarah was birthed according to promise. He is a miracle child and he represents the new covenant and in Paul's estimation, the grace of Jesus, because it's a miracle. It's the working of God in a person's life in order for the blessing to be made known. And the greater point that Paul is making is that the whole conversation, the true spiritual spirituality, the spiritual growth, true relationship with Christ is not bound in slavery. It's not bound in flesh. It's not bound in what you do or how you do it, but it's bound in freedom. It's living in the power of the spirit in what he is producing in our spiritual lives. It's him. It's God alone the spirit of God that is producing the work and the growth in our spiritual lives, that he has everything to do with it. And Paul is communicating this to the people in Galatia. He's saying that your spiritual lives are bound in him, not in what you do like Ishmael being born. That was of human nature, but Isaac was born of promise. And your spiritual lives are born in promise that they grow by him and him alone. This is not fruit that you can do on your own. It's through God. Isaac being born was a miracle. It shouldn't have happened. In fact, it was laughable. It's the work of God. Our spiritual lives are the work of God. The growth that we experience is in him. Now, I said earlier that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are not something that we can do on our own. They are not fruit that we solely produce. But Paul says in Galatians 5.16, so live by the Spirit. And he continues to explain to them that this whole life that we live, there is a conflict that is going on in the flesh and the spirit, and they're at odds with each other. And so what do we do with that? Well, God does what he does. He's faithful all the time. So where does that leave us? What do we do? It leaves us with a role to play, a role to have that we need to hold on to, and it's it's kind of like um, if you're good at your job, you just didn't naturally all of a sudden start being good at your job. You had to actually work at it just a little bit, right? You had to actually show up. You had to do something. You had to uh, accomplish something. You had to learn something. You had to play your role, right? Well, in our spiritual lives, we have a similar role that we need to play. And because we can't produce the fruit, but it's not just... Um, Spiritual growth by osmosis. It just doesn't happen. There's still a role that we play. And the 
the help, the, the answer, the, the way in which this is done is found in John 15, 1 through 8. Now, I didn't put those, for those of you that are watching on the, uh, the live stream, I didn't put them on the screen uh, that will flash up there for you. So you're going to have to just uh, kind of follow along on your own Bible. And folks, you guys haven't been getting any of the scriptures, so you're going to have to follow along on your, in your Bible as well. Jesus says this, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the work that I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Hold on to that word, remain. Count how many times it's used. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If any man does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you will remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Did you catch how many times that was in there? A lot. Seven. Somebody said seven. All right. Excellent. Um, basically, there's three jobs. Okay. God has a job. We have a job and Jesus has a job. So let's talk about God's job real quickly. God is the gardener. He's the one who owns the vineyard. He owns it all. It's all his and he does the work. He does the, the pruning. So when a, uh, a tree, a vine is bearing fruit, you prune it so that it will bear more fruit. It's not lopping it off at the root and getting rid of it because then that doesn't do any good. But he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit, especially getting rid of overgrowth and things like that. Uh, throws the, the branches away that aren't really of use anymore and burns them. And he takes care of his vineyard. He, and, and we, metaphorically, are his vineyard. Our job is to be a branch. How do you feel about that? You're a branch. You're not called to be anything else in this passage. You are called to be a branch. Now, quick question. Does a branch cease being a, a branch if it's not connected to the vine, to the root, to the tree? Eventually it does because it's tossed away, right? Our job is to be a branch that is to be connected to the tree. A branch, very, um, a branch doesn't really grow by itself, right? Have you ever seen a branch fall off of a tree and then all of a sudden another tree grows? If you did, you just witnessed a miracle because it just doesn't happen, right? Now, can a, um, a sprig be connected to a tree and then it can actually grow? Yeah, it can. That's pretty, pretty cool gardening. I don't, I've seen it happen in stuff. But the idea is that's not ideal, right? Jesus' job is this. He's the vine. He's the life giver. He's the aspect of the tree that provides nutrients and growth and all the survival stuff, you name it, whatever it might be, because you're smarter in agricultural and horticultural stuff than I am. He's the one that makes the thing, makes the stuff grow. Okay. Mark, you can catch me later and you can educate me on how, what that stuff is called. Okay. But it's the idea that the, the, that Jesus is the vine. He's the, he's the roots that goes deep into the earth, gets all the nutrients, gets all the water that is needed to nourish the rest of the vine, the tree, the plant, you name it. He gets it. He distributes it to every branch, every vine that is connected to it. Here's the, the key. And we used it a number of times, and it's the word remain. Other versions of the of our Bible will use the word abide. I really like that word. Because abiding and remaining, each of those have a connotation of being a part of. That staying connected, not being separated, but remaining, being a branch that is connected to the vine. You've seen it. 
as I've already described, when, when a branch falls off, what eventually happens to it? We just saw a major storm come through, what, a couple of weeks ago, and it was knocking trees down. And we saw this one tree that fell directly on a truck, and it was like a hot dog bun. Like they just, it just rocked it. But when a branch falls off a tree, what eventually happens to that branch? It withers and it dies. All the life that was in it before it fell is gone. Now, it might stay pliable for a little while, a couple of hours, a couple of days, but eventually it dries up. All the nutrients, all the good things are gone. And it's really not good for anything else except to be burned. Or if it's the right wood, you can build something out of it. The leaves get brittle, the twigs get brittle, and everything just can snap and disappear. And here's the key in all of this, is that this is exactly what happens to us when we're not connected to Jesus. It's exactly what happens to us. We can justify it however we want to, but when we're disconnected from Jesus, um, we can easily, easily not bear fruit. Speaking for myself, when I'm not connected to Jesus, when I am um, neglecting my responsibility, man, I can get easily angered. I can get selfish. And everything's about me. It's all about me. It's the backwards of that song. It's all about Jesus. It's all about me. I can get really focused on this guy. And when we get selfish, we can do that. Uh, when, when I'm not connected, I, I'm less willing to go out of my way to help other people. What about you? When you're not connected... What's the result for you? Be really honest with yourself. And the more this continues, the more bitter and resentful that we get, and the more difficult we are to get along with. And the key to not having this happen in our lives is the word remain. Remain, remain, remain remain, remain, remain. I'm going to get to seven. Remain, remain. That might have been eight. Doesn't matter. The idea is remain. Now you might think, well, well, yeah, that makes sense. But how well do we do at it? Are you waking up every day and you're just celebrating what God is doing in your life and you're investing in your relationship with him until I really got serious about my faith? No. Not at all. And my life showed it. When I got serious, you know what started happening? Love became natural. Joy was overwhelming. Peace. There was contentment. Life was, everything was not a big issue. Patience, like Job-like patience comes into your life. Gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, you name it, and self-control becomes a part of it. But the moment that I don't invest, the fruit that was once there begins to shrink and wither. Now, please hear me in all this. The relationship that we have with Jesus, the one that Paul is describing, the one that Jesus is describing in this passage, both of them, Galatians chapter 5 and John chapter 15, it is not a passive relationship. It's not. It's an active relationship. It is actually our participating in our role to be in relationship with God. It's... It is about doing in the sense that we have the responsibility to 
pray. We have the responsibility to get into Scripture. We have the responsibility to talk about God's Word with others and invest in that relationship. And then we will see the fruit that the Spirit gives us. We can learn all day long about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all those. But it's the Spirit that puts them in us. It's the Spirit that bears that fruit in us when we're connected to the vine. So here's what I want you to do. I dare you, this week, you wake up in the morning and you pray a prayer along the lines of, God, I know this isn't my fruit, but I know that you can grow it in me. This day, work it out. Be with me. And move about your day. 30 seconds. Move about your day, do your devotions, pray. You, you got it. But start your day before your feet hit the floor this week. Be conscious. <laughs> It's going to be tough because if you're like me, you, you wake up in the morning, ah, you don't want to say anything. You just want to moan and roll back over and wait till you get coffee. Then you can pray. That's fine. But be conscious that the, the idea is that this day, every day this week, God, it's your day. I am yours. Bear fruit in me because I'm yours. And get moving. What I know will happen is that the relationship that you have with Jesus won't be a burden. It'll be something that you celebrate. So over the course of these next nine weeks, however it gets broken out, we're going to look at all of these various fruit of the Spirit, every single one of them. We're going to learn about them. We're going to understand them. We're going to apply them to our lives. But the hope is, is that you're walking each day with not a burden, but a joyful relationship with him that you are connecting to. Okay, that's the hope. Because a burden is no fun to carry, right? It's not. But when you're doing it for the joy of the Lord, and that burden's light, and it's a good burden. So let's keep that in mind. Let me pray for you. Worship team, come and uh, lead us in our last song. Father, our hope is, is that today you have made your word known to us and that we would walk in step with you, be connected in ways with you that are only by your grace and your mercy. And our hope is, Lord, that you would continue to make, yourselves known, make yourself known to us so that we can walk in relationship with you every moment of every day and that we would be bearing fruit in our lives that we realize can't be ours. God, we can't produce the fruit of the Spirit on our own. We might get partial, but that's not of you. We want the fruit that is of the Spirit in us. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us with that. Help us to carry this with joyfulness and celebration, knowing that it's your work in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name.